Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Greg Robinson. I want to thank thank you for joining us today. I know everyone has busy clinical schedules. Hopefully, the audio is okay on your end, and you can see my screen okay. Uh, we've muted everyone's lines on purpose. <clears throat> we'll take questions via the uh, the chat feature with the GoToWebinar. So if you have questions as we go along, feel free to type those in, and we'll come back to those uh, either at the end of the presentation or if you have questions that you think of um, after this 45-minute uh, uh, dialogue, we'll be happy to answer those uh, via email or um, you know any other contact information that you provide. We'll we'll list out our contact information at the end of the presentation. Um, just kind of wait maybe one more minute. We still have a lot of people dialing in. Uh, again, this presentation is entitled "The Cancer Center of the Future: uh, Surviving and Thriving on a Budget." We presented this at uh, Astro at the SROA meeting, specifically in Boston recently, and we wanted those that uh, weren't able to attend the meeting or travel or their travel arrangements uh, were, uh, were screwed up due to the weather. Uh, we wanted to have an opportunity to go through this presentation uh, one more time. We will be recording it and posting it online as well, so in case you get pulled away and aren't able to sit in for the whole 45 minutes. Uh, we will be uh, posting this next week. So again, I thank you for uh, joining us. And um, really, the, the purpose of this presentation is to demonstrate how even in uh, these challenging times uh, with, with health care and, and with our economy, that we can not only survive but also thrive in radiation oncology. Uh, we'll do this by framing things in terms of what the cancer center of the future will or, or should look like. And so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, when we look at uh, presenting this information, we're, we're going to do it in this kind of a format. And so the outline of, of the talk really is to look these challenges in the eye. What fears and, and challenges are we currently facing, and how can we spin those into opportunities to get better? Uh, we'll do this by presenting a brief history of quality in other industries and how that applies or, or it can apply uh, to radiation oncology. With, these, uh, with the, uh, an established quality system, we believe there's a lot of opportunities for improvement in our field. And so we'll look at the system as a whole and then component by component specifically focused on contouring and treatment planning because uh, with the company that I work for, which is called Radiation Oncology Resources, that really is our wheelhouse. That is to improve the quality of radiation oncology services uh, through evidence-based quality, assessment, assurance, and mentoring of professional treatment planners. So we really are focused just on contouring and treatment planning um, specifically. This Again, this presentation, if you're just joining us, is going to be about 45 minutes. If you have questions, you can uh, use the chat feature, and, and we'll, we'll try to answer those at the end of the talk, or um, we, we can answer those at a, at a later time, and we'll put our contact information up. Uh, at the end. My name is Greg Robinson. I'm the Director of Clinical Services for Radiation Oncology Resources and we've grown into a, more of a professional services organization in the recent years. Uh, our bread and butter has been providing on-site and remote treatment planning uh, the last five years uh, through some research projects that we've done and an opportunity to work with clinicians all over the world. We've developed a new quality system service line and, and commercial software that we're going to be distributing. And, and really, that is what we've evolved to become in, in line with our mission. So back to the, the theme of the presentation, which is this cancer center of the future. If we're to envision how we are to thrive as a clinic or a collection of clinics um, you know, across the globe, one way to best do this is to think in terms of what our future self may tell us. And so this, this um, slide here. It, what it's basically demonstrating is that if we could predict the future uh, and our future self could talk to us, what perceived good ideas will ultimately, could ultimately lead us to potential uh, disaster or what ideas would be good ones that would allow us to be financially solvent. And so if our future self could give us good advice or better yet blow the whistle and prevent us from going down a bad path, what would he or she say? And so in other words, if we were to frame things in terms of uh, what the 
cancer center of the future would look like, we could throw in our hindsight glasses, which would give us perfect 2020 vision, and it would allow us to really see what those good decisions are. And we can frame things in terms of uh, the future, so it'll help us not only realize where we're currently at, but where we can go. And so ultimately, that's what a quality system is about, is an attempt to make things better. And when, when we put, when we're able to look back in time and see things that we've done, a lot of times we look back and we say, wow, I can't believe we've, we've done some of these things. And this is an actual uh, advertisement that was uh, used years and years ago where, you know, they're advertising uh, camel cigarettes and, and say, stating more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. And, you know, the, these kind of advertisements are, are all over. You could Google these types of things and, uh, you know, looking back at some of these things, any of the parents in the audience that are listening can appreciate this one. Uh, this advertisement was basically advertising uh, drinking cola, uh, you know, how soon is too soon. And basically, you know, advocating uh, early use of cola is a good thing for energy levels and, and to keep your child, uh, you know, mentally astute. But, you know, the, the point of using these types of slides is really to focus on the fact that when we're able to go through time and look at things that we've done in the past, we can really kind of step back and say, wow, I can't believe, you know, we've done some of these things. What, what types of things would we do differently if we had the chance to do them over? When we were out at Astro, a common theme and the words that are kind of speckled on the screen here that are displayed, these types of uh, key words and, and, and I guess buzzwords that were being used in some of the presentations were these. A lot of focus on quality and efficiency and improving clinical performance, um, safety. And, and so one of the talks that really caught my eye was entitled Technology, the Good, the Bad, and the Ug Ugly. And I really wish I could have viewed that presentation because that's one of the themes of this presentation as well. This field is definitely in its infancy stages. Um, it, we are uh, growing very quickly and, and technology is a big part of that. And so when we look at the challenges that we face in radiation oncology, these four things come to mind. If, if we're to have a successful, uh, quality-driven, financially solvent center, if we're, to able, if we're able to meet these challenges head on, that is safety, uh, liability, and lack of negative exposure for our clinics, uh, being able to bring in uh, revenue dollars, uh, getting better on a smaller budget, uh, being able to attract patients from an evolving demographic, and, and at the end of the day, being able to attract and retain the best colleagues uh, for your department. If we can face these challenges head on and make solid decisions in these four areas, we believe that um, certainly we would reach our goals of delivering that quality and being financially successful. So let's talk about this first one. Uh, the, that is the issue of safety, and it's been in the spotlight a lot recently. Uh, with the New York Times articles, there's this you know overarching feeling of fear. Um, you know these sensational media articles that have been published uh, brought a lot of things to attention that we were potentially doing wrong in our field and. As a result, this publication that uh, the leaders in our industry put together called Safety is No Accident was recently published. And if you haven't had an opportunity to pick up this publication, it's online uh, and, and available for uh, easy distribution. But it, it's, a, it's very well written, and they focus on a lot of key areas uh, that are important. And ultimately, these New York Times articles have forced us to sort of stop and evaluate where we're at as an industry. The second thing would be money, looking at the unsustainability and cost ineffectiveness of where we are. I mean, if you look at these graphs of our, uh, you know, we're, we're in a broken healthcare system. It was a large focus in the current elections. We have um, a ridiculous amount of healthcare spending, and it's out of control in this country. And when you look at uh, the second graph there, this life expectancy compared to the money that we're spending, um, needless to say, it's less than ideal. And so that's definitely a challenge for us right now. We know that radiation therapy is a top cost driver when you put it in terms of the overall cancer center. When you're talking about surgery and oncology, uh, we have been a top cost driver. And these coming years, we're facing a lot of budget cuts and decreases with CMS, up to a 14% decrease in payment rates. Um, and a lot of things are changing. Uh, just with the third-party management of the distribution of funds, there really is no guarantee of payment for services sometimes. Um, and it's gotten to the point, not only do we have to seek out pre-authorization for 
a 3D or an IMRT plan. We've even experienced things recently uh, because we are a dosimetry-based company, and that's primarily what we do every day. Uh, we face these challenges of getting billing reimbursement. We've even uh, had situations where we've been told by insurance companies how many beam angles we could use for a particular plan. And so the micromanagement of what we do is getting uh, increasingly worse. Uh, and we're heading down a path of probably um, a flat rate treatment um, or, you know, some type of pay, per, per, pay for performance model. And so the third challenge that we face uh, in terms of being able to deliver safe, uh, high quality, um, and attracting patients is is marketing. And we call this the, the billboard phenomenon. Typically when we define quality to the patient, this is how we do it. If you drive down any highway now, it's speckled with all of these billboards essentially advertising, if you come to our center, you're going to achieve the highest quality care here. And one way to sort of captivate their attention and to steer them in the direction of your center is to advertise hey, we just, you know, we have this piece of technology that the center around the street corner may not have. And, you know, if you come to our center, you'll be able to receive this excellent care because we have this high-tech uh, machinery. So essentially the overall message is really heavily focused on technology. And this publication addressed that. Astro uh, came out in the Safety is No Accident, and they went through these four key sections that are listed here on the screen. But essentially what they were saying was that this expansion in technology has increased the complexity tenfold of what we do. They, they, the, one of the quotes that I pulled out of there was, radiation therapy has never been simple, but it is now exceedingly complex. And a lot of that has to do with all of the technology that we've, that we've been exposed to and continues to come out. If you went to Astro or any of the most recent meetings, that's really what you're sort of bombarded with is the, uh, is the technology that, that exists and is available to us. So the definition of value, uh, when we break it down to uh, its finest element, it really is quality over cost. And essentially when we equate that to the money that we're spending on technology, are we getting the quality of, out of that equipment uh, for the money that we're spending on it? So in terms of relating that back to outcomes and patient experience, how well are we defining quality? And eventually we're going to have to prove one way or another with this pay for performance model that we are getting the value out of the money that we're spending. I like to go back to this book that, uh, that we've read here in this company, and, and it's, a, it's a study on great organizations, not just in healthcare, but in, in a lot of different industries. And what they looked at was, these financially successful um, companies that were able to retain staff and deliver high quality products and, and be financially stable, they, they wanted to investigate and look at what's inside the black box of, of these companies. What makes these companies great? And what they found was that certainly technology is important, but you can't remain, uh, you can't completely focus just on that. Uh, technology by itself is never a primary cause of either greatness or decline. And um, just thoughtless reliance on technology can be a liability and not an asset. And so really that leads to the fourth main point, which is one of the challenges we face is stability. And one of the themes of this book is that by turning the mentality of our uh, colleagues and people that work in our departments into more of an ownership mentality versus a renter mentality when they're there on the job, we'll be able, and not in a proprietary sense, but in a, in, a, in a philosophical sense, they really have ownership in what they're doing, not just with their job, but with the larger system, that uh, we'll be able to retain our staff. If we're investing in them, we'll be able to have higher dividends in that investment than we ever could in technology. And so when we look at our staff, how are we doing there? So the question really is, are your people proud of your clinic? is your clinic proud of your people? And, and it really leads to this whole idea of pride of workmanship. So when you combine great talent and unity of purpose and a quality of effort, it essentially leads to this. A lot of good stuff happening and eliminating the bad stuff, or at least reducing it greatly. And that's really one of the challenges we face is in that. And when we were sitting in Boston facing this uh, super storm Sandy that was heading our way, we thought about the challenges that 
not only we were going to get ready to face, but also the local people that live there. And the Northeast is definitely not used to seeing huge storms like this rolling through. And uh, yeah, at least not as, uh, they're not as prominent as, as, say, down in Florida, where when you look at the natural ecosystem uh, of the Northeast compared to down in Florida, the trees are built to withstand high winds and storms, uh, you know, to greater magnitude. There's better preparations that uh, that people that live there uh, have have um, you know created in an effort to uh, prevent future damage and ensure safety. And and really, these challenges have led to opportunities to get there. And so back to these four challenges that we presented at the beginning. How can we take these four challenges and recast them as goals? So when we look at safety and money and marketing to future patients and stability. Let's ask these four questions. How do I maximize safety and mitigate risk? How do I continue to improve quality on a much smaller budget? How do I track patients by proving and advertising that my clinic's doing well? And how do I ultimately attract and keep good staff? And when we look at quality as a whole, a lot of times we, when we discuss quality, one of the people we always reference is W. Edwards Deming. And he was well known and has written a lot of books and, and publications on um, not only assessing quality, but also establishing a continual improvement plan. We'll go over later why his methods have been instrumental in other industries and how he did it and accomplished it. Um, but essentially why I'm bringing his name up here is when you go back to this Astro publication, Safety is No Accident, they mention in one of the sections in there, uh, they allude to this Toyota production system and implementing lean approaches into our industry. And so when you talk about workflow efficiency, how that impacts quality and safety, um, all of the concepts that uh, Toyota and a lot of the manufacturing uh, that came out of the auto industry in Japan were taught by Deming and his colleagues. And that's why we always reference him in his book that he wrote. Um, there's a mention of this word called Kaizen, which basically refers to continual improvement, you know, change for the better. And so if we're constantly tweaking the system, we can ensure that we're adding uh, value to our system and removing waste along the way. And so obviously Astro sees value in incorporating a lean system such as that to improve things. And, and Deming had this overall system of profound knowledge is what he called. And essentially what he looked at was where is variability? Where does it exist? How can we get rid of it? And with that um, theory of uh, or having a, a greater understanding of the quality system as a whole. And they applied this to manufacturing specifically and some other industries. But um, what we're proposing is that a lot of these same ideals can be used in our industry. So when you break down all the critical components of what we do every day in radiation oncology from bringing in diagnostic images and fusing those images, bringing them through uh, to the contouring stage, through treatment planning, doing the QA, and then when the patient's on the table, doing the setup, immobilization, and delivering the, the radiation, all of these different areas can be viewed as individual quality opportunities that we can get better using the philosophies that Deming taught. And so, at Radiation Oncology Resources, we're really focused on the first two silos, which is what are the implications of inaccurate or inconsistent contouring on a daily basis? And for a given treatment planning system, are all plans created equal? In other words, if we were to give the same set of parameters to a treatment planner, would every plan be built the same? And so we've been curious. Uh, to these questions, answers to these questions for, for some time. And we've been making presentations to dosimetrists. I know there's some dosimetrists on the call today, but we have a wide scope of backgrounds and uh, responsibilities that are dialed in right now. And, and, and I, I guess the point I want to make on the slide is that really Astro even says that when it comes to contouring and evaluating plan quality, that it's not just any one person's responsibility. As technology has grown, it's everyone's responsibility to be involved in that process and to have some understanding of what a quote-unquote good treatment plan would look like. But that's a really tough thing to define. Historically, we would follow the physician prescription and beam parameters and then check that against what we were delivering. So in the 2D world, it was pretty easy to do. What technology has provided us 
on on a on on the good side is enormous possibilities for the patient to be able to sculpt dose, to escalate dose, to spare organs at risk, to improve quality of life, uh, and to cure cancer. But what it's done on the bad side is it has really increased our limitations to accuracy. So variability and the possibilities of variability has grown. And we've seen that a lot with IMRT and VMAP planning. Again, we have the ability to escalate dose and to sculpt dose to increase uh, quality of life. But the trade-offs are there, it, it, it introduces confusion, variability, and the groundwork of all the studies that we always reference on acute and late side effects and the things that we always hang our hat on they're all rooted in the assumption that contours and plans are the same. So again, as the technology evolution has increased, the artistry, quote unquote, of, of producing a plan and saying a plan is acceptable has definitely increased. And for a professional treatment planner, it's really tough to define or to, to discover areas for best practices. Because when we look at designing a treatment plan, and I don't expect anyone to read all this text, but when we look at designing a treatment plan, a one-line prescription is now turned into a book. We're given not only a list of dose constraints that we're required to meet for the targets, but also organs at risk, and we're given certain parameters that we have to meet uh, and, and some you know, variation acceptable limits. A lot of this is you know, through the RTOG, inspired by different publications like Quantech and things like that. Uh, we are looking at evaluating very elegant dose distributions and, and sculpting dose to get target coverage and spare the organs at risk. We have, you know, for a typical head and neck plan, for instance, we have a, 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 a monster list of structures that we have to track, contour, and, and, and make sure that we're delivering or avoiding uh, dose in some areas. And then we have these crazy graphs that we look at and print off and put in the chart. And, and for someone that hasn't been involved in the planning process, how can you look at something like this and really say, yeah, this is a good treatment plan? And, and so it becomes increasingly tough to sift through all of this paperwork and documentation and um, you know histograms such as this to really uh, know what is good and what is bad. And we kind of have resonated with this theme with some of the research projects that we've been doing that we believe we, the more complex the planning process has gotten, we're comparing apples to oranges. And so how can we get to the point where we're comparing apples to apples? Well, it needs to start with looking at the finer elements of what goes into d to producing a treatment plan. So you would start with this quality silo of anatomy accuracy. And as this cartoon suggests that uh, the handle on your recliner doesn't qualify as an exercise machine, the reason that we put that here was one of the things that we hear a lot uh, when it comes to anatomy accuracy is that we're required to take some anatomy class or some level of that in our education to uh, be uh, providing treatment plans or to be reviewing treatment plans. And so just because we've had an anatomy class, that doesn't necessarily mean we're doing things the same way as everyone else or that qualifies as a quote unquote quality system for contouring. There are a lot of publications that are out there when in terms of um, looking at contouring variability. This one was out of uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin which showed a high degree of variability with contouring breast tissue and uh, they had several clinicians contour on the same data set and then looked at and evaluated this whole idea of variability and they found it to be pretty significant. So we know that contouring is the foundation of all the processes that we provide in, in radiation oncology. If the contouring is off, as this illustration suggests, then everything that's riding on that path is going to be affected, whether it's the beam model or we can have the most accurate uh, delivery and setup that we could possibly do. Our IGRT can be spot on, or even our treatment plan can be of the highest quality, but if the contouring isn't rock solid, then everything on that road is affected. We performed our own study. Uh, this publication from 2009 in the Red Journal uh, analyzed variation of various organs at risk. We looked at a prostate case and a head and neck case. And really, we had clinicians from all over the world uh, bring in the DICOM sets, uh, contour these, and then we used a quantitative piece of software to look at over and under contouring voxels and using a established metric score 
uh, with the software, we were able to analyze the variability that we saw um, on the same data set. And I've said this several times, but as this graph here illustrates, variability was pretty pretty evident. And when we sifted through the data, I mean, some structures were worse than others, but the one thing that we could consistently agree on was that the rectum should be colored brown and the bladder should be colored yellow. And, and that was that was one of the most consistent things that we saw with, with the information we got back. Um, you know, some of the structures like a parotid or a larynx, uh, they were highly variable, and you can imagine what kind of effect that has on the overall treatment plan. When physicians are reviewing a plan, they're assuming that those are all contoured consistently the same, regardless of who's doing the work. And so the question really is, how can we ensure that that's being done? Um, in a nutshell, the, the data that we got from the contouring challenges that we hosted, uh, this was just a snapshot of some of that, but certainly for some structures, there wasn't that much variability, and you, and you would expect that. Uh, there were very variable structures, and there, this is just um, a few that we've listed here. So we saw variability all over the body, from, really from head to toe, and, and the same thing has been documented in other studies. This one was was uh, presented by the um, by a dosimetry school in Illinois, and they studied their dosimetry students' ability to do contouring for organs at risk. And what they found was that just by doing a simple evaluation uh, quantitatively, looking at the results uh, and, and coming together with some sort of teaching intervention, that they were able to improve results overall dramatically. And they saw consistently a 20 to 30 percent increase in contouring accuracy. So what about treatment planning? When we look at the plan uh, silo, uh, there's a big focus on technology, obviously. And so you see this picture here of, uh, of athletes running around a track. And, and one of them here is barefoot, not wearing shoes. So we kind of use this metaphor of the technology in our field, kind of like the shoes that a runner wears. And the, the shoes are advertised that you know, if you have th this uh, pair of shoes, that you're going to be guaranteed success and to be run and to run faster than than the average athlete. Uh, and we know that that's not true. And I think the same could be applied to our beliefs with the technology that's used with with producing a treatment plan. We are curious to see ultimately with some of the research projects that we've been running. Um, with the same parameters, are all planners built the same? So we've been hosting and running a project called the Plan Challenge for several years. We've uh, provided the information and feedback and publications on several different body sites. Uh, we ran the study with, with uh, common clinical data sets like a head and neck, a GYN case, brain, prostate fossa, to name a few. And essentially what we were trying to do was look at um, could we objectively measure plan quality? Before I get into that, just to give you the scope of the project, every year it's grown in magnitude. Um, as you can see here, the total number of reg registrants have increased year after year. Um, last year we had around three to 400 that were uh, participating in, in two different body sites, but these were, this is some data that we collected for different planning systems, and we had people that participated from all over the world, from not just the United States, from Canada, uh, South Africa, Australia, Singapore, and various other countries. In, in 2011, we slammed the brakes on what we were doing originally with the project, and we actually changed the rules of the plan challenge. We not only provided the target contours, but we gave um, all the organ at risk contours. So as important as contouring is to evaluating plan quality, we wanted to eliminate another variable. And so we provided all of the organs at risk, and we really just wanted to look at uh, the ability of the dosimetrist to conform dose and to do the things that the average uh, physician would ask in producing a clinical plan. This data landed a publication in the Pro Journal that just came out, um, and uh, if you're interested in, in receiving a copy of that article, you can contact us and we can send that to you. But simply by using some metrics that we designed that we called a PQM, and I'll describe that in a second, we were better able to evaluate variability. And so essentially what the PQM was was a, a total composite score of all of these various components that go into evaluating a plan so that we could 
essentially objectively quantify uh, plan quality. How the project ran was we provided a uh, set of CT images with all of these contours on, and then the participants downloaded that into their treatment planning system, did the plan, and then uh, returned it back to us for review. And as I said, we used this idea of a PQM, don't let the metaphor uh, confuse you, really it was just some uh, a combination of individual uh, constraints or goals that a physician would use when evaluating a certain plan. We assigned a weighted metric score to those goals, and then when you added up all the individual scores, the total composite score is what we called the PQM. And really what that allowed us to do was take this overall plan assessment down to a single number. Uh, we really were inspired with a lot of these metrics with publications that are out there from the RTOG and Quantech and things like that. And they were different for each body site. And we won't get into all the, uh, all the gritty details of what each PQM uh, was or or how it was built, but in in, in and then that 's all listed in the publication, but essentially what we saw was a wide distribution of results so when you look at the x axis that represented the p q m score and with a total possible score of being one hundred and fifty, which was really unachievable compared to all the trade offs that go into the planning process essentially um, based on the provided criteria, what we saw was a pretty high degree of variability and, and you can see the min score was around a 58, the max score was about 140 and and then scores that were were collected that were in between. Now variability has several technical meetings, meanings and statistics and other and engineering and some other industries but really for our purposes the definition of variability is is at least what we were wanting to look at was simply the difference between what the results could be and what they actually were. So when you looked at an illustration like this, how can we minimize variability? It became less about achieving a high score and more about how can we decrease the amount or the range of scores that we were seeing. So when we designed the study, we again had a list of constraints, typically what you would see with a physician prescription or you know a, a publication that refers to acute and late side effects, and we wanted to incorporate as many of those as possible into the overall evaluation. For each one, we assigned a weighted score, and then the sum total of those scores would, would be the PQM score. So when you look at a distribution like this, really what we were getting to was that uh, we were coming to the conclusion that not all planners are created equal. And whether that's not having access to the right information, you really can't hang your hat on having a specific piece of technology. There was really no statistical correlation between planning system and the planner's ability to achieve a high score or guarantee you against a low one. Um, the, really what we found was that if you have access to the right information and uh, technology, you, you'll be able to achieve a high score. We, were, we did a study, we were able to compare the PQM score versus IMRT versus uh, RapidArc and saw you know, a, a simil, similar statistical, non-statistical correlation with uh, the quality of the overall plan. Years of experience, that's another criteria that uh, we sort of use as uh, future hires for our department and guaranteeing quote-unquote quality in our industry, which through these studies we've seen time and time again that years of experience doesn't necessarily equate to at least a high score in this particular uh, set of parameters. Same thing with being uh, CMD certified. Uh, we saw, and again, the, this is somewhat skewed because we had a lot of international participants that don't have CMD certification. But um, you know, we wanted to see what kind of correlation there was with being certified uh, and taking that didactic exam and how it would relate to doing uh, a, this particular project. And so. Through the years we've been collecting this information, we've, and I know a lot of people that are on the call have seen some of that many, many times, and, and we've, we've presented this variability, but now we're sort of asking the question, well, now what? I mean, it's, it's one thing to present all this variability, but what are we going to do about it? Uh, in terms of contouring and treatment planning, how do we eliminate or at the very least reduce variability? So when you look at a curve like this, before we have some sort of quality system or continual improvement plan, 
the goal isn't to achieve a high score. Again, the, the, the goal of a continual improvement plan is to drive out variability and to in, ensure that you're going to have a higher mean performance, uh, a better best and a better worst, in other words. So when you, when you link that back to what Deming and his philosophies were, he measured components of subsystems, and they, they did one study with looking at transmissions, the same transmission that was built in the United States versus the ones that were built in Japan, and consistently they found that the ones built in Japan with the same parts had overall higher quality time and time again. Well, before 1950, Japanese consumer goods had a reputation for being somewhat shoddy and cheap, and then four years later, uh, Japanese quality and dependability was, was really turned upside down. How did this happen? They, Deming and his colleagues went to Japan. They had over 400 engineers that studied in this intensive course, and what they, what they taught was looking, using statistical analysis and measuring quality would ensure uh, continuous improvement. And as this book kind of stated that uh, innovation can definitely lead to improvement in processes, but the main theme of the book was that new machinery and gadgets will not be the ultimate answer. Uh, that, and, and he really thinks that these philosophies, even says in the book, that these philosophies can work in service industries like healthcare. Now, we know it's not practical to, on a daily grind uh, when you're being tasked with, with, with producing plans very quickly and efficiently. It's not practical to have to review and, and have each contour suspect to some sort of critical review. There's a trust that gets built over time, but what is practical and achievable is establishing a quality system that can improve overall quality, mitigate risk, and have a big impact without a million dollar price tag. And so the common approach to problem solving that we as humans typically do is we brainstorm a bunch of ideas, we categorize those ideas, we analyze them, and then we act. What Deming was suggesting was that we spin that philosophy into more of a continual improvement plan where we design a plan, we do the plan, the key is to study those results objectively with measurement and then act, as opposed to how I typically do work around the house, which is to guess, just do it, the whole thing blows up in my face, and then I try to fix it. Deming was preaching this plan, do, study, act mindset, and going back to this Astro publication, the safety is no accident, they talk about this intimate relationship that needs to exist with the vendor that's providing the technology and the end user. Um, unfortunately, what happens in this field is that technology comes out so fast and there are very few training programs that are out there that, that there's a breakdown in the system. And this, as this last uh, sentence here says in this box, with the changing healthcare environment, Nevertheless, centers must ensure that providers are qualified to deliver any care for which they are privileged. So one of the suggestions in this publication is to um, establish a checks and balances system, uh, really hone in on your policies and procedures, but they even come out and say here that reliance on policies and procedures is usually the least effective approach. And so how do we accomplish the goals that we've set out um, at the beginning, these challenges that we face? As this book results that last come out and say the key that and one of the things that Deming preached was that the key is going to be in measuring. Uh, measurement can be a diagnostic and a process improvement tool, and ultimately what gets measured is going to get improved. And without having some type of measurement system, and it's really tough to define that for contouring and planning, we we really as a whole will never be able to improve. And that's what we've uh, sort of been inspired to build here at ROR is our new quality system called ROCKS, and that's essentially the last uh, theme of uh, and last key point of this presentation. And at going back to this whole variability idea, this quote from a physician in Italy that said, you know, inconsistencies in contouring targets and critical structures still remains to be the most variable thing that uh, that remains in our field. And, and going back to all the things that Deming taught with this plan, do, study, act mindset, with our ROCKS program, we've, we've coined the phrase metric-based assessment, objective benchmarking, personalized learning, and measured improvement to replace that plan, do, study, act uh, uh, in the continuum wheel. We partnered with some physicians in London, Ontario. We ran some physician-based 
uh, contouring challenges and as this publication here laid out, essentially what we did was we brought in all of the different various contours on the same data set, compiled those into a set of consensus contours, and that has become the foundation of our continual improvement plan here. I mean, and, there, and there are similar other plans that uh, have been presented in publications. This one came out of Loyola in Chicago where they took their staff and they had them all contour common organs at risk that we all face as a challenge every day. And through their study, they, they evaluated where everyone stood on the first go around objectively and then looked at where the structures varied the most, then went back through this process of, of measuring and then per, uh, kind of a personalized intervention uh, learning program. And then as you can see with these purple bars here, it essentially demonstrates um, that improvement that, that they saw. And, and we've, we've developed and seen similar things with our quality system here. Is, and our quality system for contouring centers on six regions of the body, the head and neck, the brain, uh, thorax, GI, GU, and GYN. Uh, essentially, we assign organ at risk to be contoured, and then we'll bring those in, measure those uh, objectively, and we have a video training library that shows uh, common areas, and it's all customizable for whoever went through the program so that they can not only look at their initial results but figure out wh how they can get better. And so using that same process, we give them a CQM score or a contour quality metric score, which goes beyond just giving them a score. It shows them where they were able to fall in relation to what was possible or what, uh, let's say, their own colleagues were able to um, uh, achieve. And as you can see here with the, the blue bars here, this was the a sample of initial assessment. And then after going through the program, really sort of trying to um, narrow down that variability and shift the scores to the right, which was the ultimate goal. And this, this is showing um, one of the structures that we had listed, which was the brain stem. And so again, they would bring in the, the contours and then we would, through the customized learning program, show them where their breakdowns occurred. The penalty would be based on how far away it was from the reference. And then after viewing this uh, training video, showing where the breakdowns occurred, they could then recontour that same structure. And, uh, and then the ultimate goal, again, would be to, to move that score to the right. So we established something similar for treatment planning, and our goal as this publication from UCLA states really was to develop very tight criteria beyond um, what's deemed as acceptable and, and start, starting to look at what's possible. And we have six regions of the body, again, that we've, um, we've built this ROCKS program, this quality system around common body sites that uh, and, and, and the emphasis really is on IMRT and VMAP planning because of the complexity of the plans. It, the cornerstone of it, again, hinges on this PQM mindset where we establish a set of metrics and, and, and give a overall score. One of the unique things that we do through this program is we've developed a, uh, a commercial software that actually we'll be giving a demonstration on next week. If you're interested in attending that webinar, I believe it will be on, on the 20th. And uh, there's more information on our website about it. But the engine that we use to drive the process uh, essentially looks and behaves somewhat like a treatment planning system where we can drive dose files in, look at all the beam properties of the plan. We can look at the dose distribution and evaluate that. We can, again, look at the dose volume histograms and all the key features. But the unique thing about the software is we can establish a performance score for all of the physician stated goals that go into the planning process and you know greens and yellows would sort of equate to a higher uh, level score and then the things that are flagged with red or orange would be key areas for continual improvement and so that score is then highlighted here in yellow set against a backdrop a distribution of scores that their peers or other people that have participated in the program have been able to do so again, the goal is to uh, show measured improvement through the program. And the way the process works, again, is in summary, is, is to drive that clinical plan through the software, assign a PQM score, compare that to the population of peers, which ultimately adds to the population of best practices. And then we can refine those down, but ultimately what we're able to do is get away from comparing apples to oranges and 
narrow down variability, we use this ROCKS program as a way to uh, increase efficiency and safety in our group and, and eliminate and reduce plan re redos, which is ultimately going to save money um, and establish realistic clinical goals. By comparing plans apples to apples, we can then start getting into really having a better understanding of what the end patient outcomes will be. So again, the distribution that we look at when we uh, accumulate the scores really is to, our goal is to try to drive those scores as far to the right as possible. So if someone scores below the mean or just average their first go around by using the software and the process that we've implemented, uh, we're able to move the score to the right of the bell curve. Back to this book, this good to great book uh, that we referred to at the very beginning, what he says in this book is that good can be the enemy of great. And um, one of the themes of the book is that a systematic focus on quality shouldn't be 100% technology driven. I mean, as important as technology is, it's not going to ignite a transformation from going from good to great. And technology can definitely accelerate that transformation, but it's not going to do it on its own. The key is investing in our people, which by looking at all these individual silos and, and analyzing and measuring and figuring out how we can improve each step of the process through testing, training, sharing best practices, and setting up a continual improvement plan, that essentially is allowing us to invest in our people. And Deming had a unique philosophy on leading companies to long-term success. I mean, he had a lot of, uh, of different ideas. Some of the ideas in his book are listed here, and some of the key ones are centered on instituting training and education and self-improvement, but really driving out fear. I mean, when we, t when we go back and we talk about those New York Times articles and this, and this overarching feeling of fear that we, we now have, that could actually deter us from getting better because uh, we may get paralyzed by that. And w when, when we think about in terms of establishing a good quality system, imagine the, per the perfect cancer center of the future where they've invested in equipment from vendors who stress reliability, where your staff understands sources of variation and what they can do to control it and get better. You know, you have quarterly assessments and regular assessments uh, of, of best practices, and you have an ongoing database of plan quality performance. Compare that center to a common center that we see nowadays where there's a lot invested in money in billboard equipment with all the bells and whistles, that clinicians believe their own in their own billboards and have, you know, really focus on shrinking margins, escalating dose. Our, our equipment and methods are optimized by CPT codes. There's really no proven testing and training of contouring accuracy, and that population of planning skills uh, really doesn't exist. So compare site B to site A, and then ask the question: Which site sounds safer or more cost effective? Which place would you rather be treated at? Or, or work and, and, and stay working for, for an extended amount of time. And, and that's really how we envision the ideal radiation therapy center to be operating. And so again, a well-designed quality system will maximize that safety and mitigate risk, improve quality, but on a much smaller budget. You'll be able to market that quality to your future patients and hopefully attract and retain the best staff because you'll be investing in them. And, and we really foresee that the planning process of the future will be not only just contouring, optimizing, and doing the plan review process, but it's, in, it's going to incorporate uh, very customizable, easy-to-use EMR results that are linked to performance. And, and ultimately, you'll be able to track this data so that clinical trials are better, best practices are documented, and you can do true cost analysis on, on the work that you're doing. And so again, the, the cancer center of the future, really the theme is investing in the individual and, and, the right, and that, that truly is the right technology. Uh, I think I'm at the end of my time here. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can, uh, or you want more information on this ROCK system that we've, that we've developed, uh, you can go to our website here or email us at this email address at the bottom of the screen. And again, uh, thank you for um, your time. I know everyone has cl busy clinical schedules, and I think we're past our 45 minutes. So, uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email us or um, um, or let us know. I'm looking at the, the chat feature here. 
one of the questions that came in talks about ACR accreditation and does that guarantee quality. I can't really speak on that. I know of some, the center that uh, some of the centers that we support and plan for uh, have gone through ACR accreditation, and it's a great process. It really forces you to look at all the individual <clears throat> processes in your clinic. Uh, what we saw was that it really opened the communication lines between different staff. And um, but I do know that going through the process, there was a heavy focus on policies and procedures. There really was no drill down of contouring accuracy and and plan quality that those things were the the surface was scratched with some of those things but um i maybe in the future there'll be uh, uh those things will be boiled down a little bit more just looking at other questions coming in Again, uh, thank you for your time, and I don't see any other questions coming in. If you have, um, if you have any other questions about our rock system, and again, we have a, uh, I think we have a webinar scheduled for Friday specifically on the rocks program. A lot of it is going to be redundant information if you sat through this entire presentation. Um, but we next week we do have a separate uh, live demonstration of our new commercial software that's going to be released in January. So definitely feel free to attend that. And if you want more information on that, you can visit. Um, the website address that I had up on the screen earlier. Um, thanks again for your time and, and have a good day.